Right, Rachel, you'd be pleased to know that we are now recording. Um, just you. bear with me a sec. Right. So, yeah, if everybody who hasn't thus far um, could perhaps put themselves on mute, that would be much appreciated. Um, so we don't have impromptu heckling in the background. Um, good. Um, well, good morning, everybody. And um, uh, thank you for paying attention to your email. Um, Obviously, we're, we're starting a little earlier this morning because both Kate and Lord Blunkett, who will be joining us at 10 o'clock, have um, other diary commitments. Um, and I'm particularly grateful to, to both for finding the time to squeeze um, an appearance in um, when I know just, well, I can only imagine how much you've got going on at the moment, Kate. Uh, and I'm sure Lord Blunkett's in much the same situation. So. Um, once again, Kate Nichols, OBE, Chief Executive of UK Hospitality, has kindly agreed to join us to give us uh, an update on what is going on in the corridors of power and uh, on the work that she and her team are doing at UK Hospitality. Um, and then we will be joined at 10 o'clock or hopefully just before 10 o'clock by Lord Blunkett, who I don't think needs much introduction either, um, to provide us with his views on the pandemic and what, indeed what the future lies and what is happening at Westminster. Um, so without further ado, um, Kate, welcome again. Thank you so much for giving us your time. Uh, it's, it's massively appreciated. Um, as per usual, can I hand you the baton just to give us a, a general update? And equally, as per usual, um, if anybody has questions for Kate, please drop them into the chat box. And time allowing, I will pose your questions um, to Kate. Um, is that all right with you, Kate? Yep, that's absolutely fine. No problem. Uh, Hold on, I'm just going to mute one or two late arrivals um, just to make sure you're not getting heckled. Thank you. Um, so again, if anybody who's just arrived the call, on the call hasn't um, muted themselves, perhaps you would be kind enough to do so. Um, Good. Over to you, Kate. Now, I'll, I'll, as people join, if they don't don't mute themselves, I'll, I'll do my best to keep up with the flow and make Thank sure they are muted. Thank you. Um, and I will I will just give a very brief overview so that we do leave plenty of time for questions. Um, and, and, and I'll probably focus a little bit more attention on, on Westminster and what's coming out of Westminster, because there is still so much that's uncertain about the involved administrations, although we are working across all of those with, with UK hospitality. We have really strong uh, representation in Scotland, in particular working close to TA in Wales, working with the, the, the Licensees Association there as well, where um, we, we're sort of the main for, for tourism and hospitality in Wales, um, and our sister organisation, Hospitality Ulster. So we do share information across all four devolved administrations, and we uh, use the leverage that we've got as a UK body to make sure that, that we're inputting effectively across that. Um, and also making sure that we, we can uh, deploy all the tactics that are at our disposal where Westminster says something helpful, we can cascade it out. Equally, where Scotland does something really helpful, we can bring it back to Westminster to, to reinforce the points. So I'll touch on all of that, but I am going to cover more detail of, of what's happening in Westminster, given the roadmap where England is ahead of the curve. Lessons we can learn from that. And ahead of UK hospitality. Ahead is brilliant. to tomorrow's budget. Um, so just to, to reinforce our three point plan, I think probably I spoke to you beginning of the year where we, we've done intensive research with our members across all four devolved administrations and the work that we've done with our working groups uh, to make sure that we were in touch with what the grassroots day to day operators were wanting and needing coming out of of the lockdown and the process that we wanted to go through. Um, so we, we have we sort of uh, once a week, we have meetings with small pubs, large pubs, small restaurants, large restaurants, independent hoteliers, uh, hotel chains, and all of the other areas that we represent to make sure that we're totally touching base with, with what's going on there. Um, and also getting their feedback on the economic impact. 
And I think that's really been the bedrock of what we've been doing over the last couple of months is to make sure that that is fed in at all levels. And we know that uh, the influence that that has had where we've got evidence based research, clear understanding of the economic impacts of all the various decisions um, and uh, scientific independent evidence as well about risk mitigations that have already been taken. That stood us in really good stead as we've been influencing policy to try and get the reopening roadmap going through successfully. Not as quickly as we would like in all of the administrations, nowhere near as much detail as we would hope for um, in the, the three other devolved administrations other than, than England, but that evidence base has been absolutely critical. And it, again, it's been shared collectively around the UK and it's that leverage of a strong national voice being able to get that leverage and push. Um, so, so all of the devolved administrations have had a, a separate independent research from EHOs looking at our mitigations against the risks identified by SAGE to prove that hospitality is safe. Um, they've had economic analysis to look at exactly what it means for every single bit of, um, of restriction that is imposed upon a business. What does it do to revenue? And then we've uh, placed that against the support measure. So, just coming out, that's the sort of background of what we've been doing to, to, to get to this point. Um, the, the roadmap that we've got in England now, I think, provides a really good template. And again, our teams have been taking that back out, working in concert with the tourism associations and tourism alliances in all of the devolved administrations. Key points that we've, we've emphasised the need for um, an indicative timeline and clarity around dates. England, obviously, we've successfully got dates. They are indicative. They are no earlier than. But as we saw this time last year when we were talking to Westminster about reopening, as soon as you get dates out in the public mind, they start to firm up. Uh, and the 4th of July was a no earlier than date last July in England, and it became very firm. So uh, it, the things that we asked for were uh, indicative dates if we couldn't have exact, a clear timetable and scheduling for reopening, with a sequence so we understand what we're going to do. A commitment to notice, uh, a minimum period of notice is now built into to the English framework. You've got three weeks, you've got a review, um, and then you've got two weeks notice that, that the date can be firmed up, which is really important for operators. So we will get at least one to two weeks. And then most importantly, a hard backstop. The really important thing that we got out of uh, the roadmap from the prime minister was 21st of June, all legal restrictions on social interaction, socializing uh, and the operation that goes alongside it are to go. And that is their 100% commitment. And that's what we're pushing to make sure that it's really firmed up. So that framework, that template is what we've been taking out to the other devolved administrations to ask them to follow. We know it entirely that, you know, in Scotland, the worst thing you can possibly do is go and say, please, could you copy what England did and use England's date? Um, same in Wales, it is just likely to make them go the opposite direction. It works in Northern Ireland, uh, where they're close partners, but it doesn't work in Scotland and Wales. But the principle of indicative timeline, clarity and certainty, notice period, and a hard backstop where you commit to remove the operational restrictions that mean we're not profitable, absolutely critical. So we're working through in England now the dates and the details. There is a lot of devil in the detail that we're going to come out with to look at those three stages. But we, we do know now we've got 29th of, of um, March, which is when outdoor exercise, outdoor uh, sport and leisure, including pools, reopen. Um, 12th of April, indoor leisure, gyms, outdoor hospitality um, and non-essential retail. And then 17th of May, indoor hospitality reopening, major events reopening up to a thousand people indoors, 4,000 people outdoors. So that's a big escalation up into, into what you can do. And then, as I say, this key point about 21st of June being the backstop when we can look at reopening nightclubs, major events that are purely social. That's when you get back to conference and banqueting awards dinners, gala dinners, major trade shows, etc., and a commitment to move towards normality. Now, it's not as fast as lots of people would have liked in England, um, particularly there is concern around the, and, and still a lot of uncertainty around the date of unlocking hospitality in terms of hotels, self-contained accommodation, what does that mean? Some accommodation opening 12th of April, some held back for the 17th of May, particularly hostels and shared facilities and shared uh, services. Um, but, but you've got that sort of, uh, when you do reopen, you're reopening with fewer restrictions. 
So the things that are removed straight away from what we had in England, and again, this is something where we're trying to push across the lessons from, from England into the rest of the UK, and also drawing on the legal challenges that emerged in England across the rest of the UK. We have lost curfew altogether. We have lost substantial table meals and restriction on the service of alcohol only altogether. Both of those were challenged in court. Um, now, it doesn't have a direct read across, but that principle of evidence to justify why a curfew and uh, a restriction on the sale of alcohol with food should give you a better public health outcome, really helpful when you come to look across the rest of um, the United Kingdom. What we then have in England is a return back to the rule of six. We have different approaches in England, Wales, uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland. The other three devolved administrations remove primary school children from their calculation of people that are allowed to socialise together. So you have different uh, amounts, but in England, it, children are included. We now have a rule of six, six people from up to six different households or two households if you want a bigger group. So if you are two households, which includes the support bubble, you can be a much bigger group in indoor and outdoor hospitality from those dates that we're going through. So we're then working through all the details about weddings, when they restart, how they restart. And then critically, there are um, four next steps which have more relevance and resonance across the rest of the UK, although they are being driven by the Westminster government. So there are four major reviews that are undertaken at the moment to look at other aspects of unlocking. One is around international travel and tourism and when will that restart? Uh, and that's an indicative date of reporting in the 12th of April with a view to allowing some international travel from uh, 17th of May. So cl clearly that will pick up points about quarantine, managed quarantine, self-isolation, how long those proposals last, but it'll also move into the, the points that you need for reopening international travel and liaison with the EU in particular. Feeds into the second, review point, which is COVID status uh, certification, the longhand version of vaccine passports, but also looking at lateral flow testing, because if you look at the Israeli model, which is what we know Michael Gove and Matt Hancock are looking at, the Israeli model doesn't just pick up the rate of vaccination, it also picks up um, acquired immunity from people who've had cases and can demonstrate they've had COVID, so antigen testing and antibody testing as well. Um, it picks up people who've had a negative test and the aspiration of the government is to get cases low, vaccinations high, and then test the population for a long period of time, an aspiration that you could be testing the workplace, uh, testing for major events and access to major events uh, in order to, to reopen more rapidly and keep reopen. There's, there's research out there that suggests a, a lateral flow testing and surge testing of the types they've been doing around new variants, where you, you sort of do it for a period of three to four days over a long weekend. It is the, has the equivalent, if people follow it through with self-isolation, of a six to, to, to 10 week lockdown. So the, the key to, to allowing reopening without having second and third waves and going into future lockdowns is seen by the government as being lateral flow testing. And this is where the UK is, is more in terms of strategy and approach that it's adopting. So, so that is a second huge piece of work. It is, however, being chaired by Michael Gove. Um, therefore, it will happen. So the idea of should we have vaccine passports, shouldn't we, the debate around do you need them, will, will we have it? Michael Gove is a firm believer and a convert to that. He's the most hawkish in the cabinet. If he is chairing that, it's got a predetermined um, outcome. So we need to work with it. So you will see that coming through. Um, then two other bits that, that are sort of uh, in train. One is in train already, which is events pilot research which will look at lateral flow testing for opening up the bigger events, the mass events that are 4,000 people plus. So that's your Cheltenham Gold Cups, your return to, to sort of full um, uh, outdoor sport and, and uh, sports fans probably just ahead of the Euros coming to the UK. Uh, but it'll also look at places that, that can't operate with social distancing. So cinemas, theatres, nightclubs, it'll look at potential for, for COVID uh, status certification and lateral flow testing as part of that. And then the final review is around social distancing, which will look at are there any residual restrictions that we need to have post 21st of June when the, the other restrictions fall away. So you can go back to table service in England, you can go back uh, to, to more than the rule of six and, and having restrictions on your social life. 
likely to, to focus on, on including uh, face masks being kept for longer, some potential residual social distancing in terms of space um, and ventilation for longer until the whole adult population is vaccinated. But the clear thing we've got and the, the thing that helped us unlock the roadmap at Westminster level was an exit strategy linked to vaccine rollout linked to a sort of a sort of a move away from just being focused on deaths hospitalizations and cases but actually linked to vaccine rollout and pace of vaccine rollout um, and also the sort of sur any surge that, that that hospitalizations and cases might might overwhelm the nhs the only thing that is a sort of fly in the ointment potentially is new variants uh, but the vaccine rollout should help with that uh, and and so the, the pace and scale of rollout is what is determining um, the approach and, and the lockdown. So that data, not dates, is something that we can translate across and have been translating across to push for as early a possible reopening date from all the devolved administrations. And then in, in other steps, clearly that ties in with the budget, which is coming tomorrow, where you now have a, a sort of defined area uh, and length of time when support might be needed to get people to reopening. And then the debate really that we've been pushing the hardest is, is not about support to reopening, it's support for longer. And the length of term of the support and the extension of the measures as we come out of this, the, the high level of indebtedness that we're going to face in hospitality after protracted periods of closure uh, and restricted trading. So, you know, on average, it's been about 10 months of, of closure, 10, 11 months of closure out of the last 14 by the time we get to sort of an England reopening of May, June, um, longer in, in other devolved administrations, but severely restricted trading uh, ability. So that level of indebtedness, particularly around rents um, and, and the finance. So, so uh, the length of support through recovery being essential. Key ones there that are UK wide, um, the VAT rate, the lower rate of VAT to be able to, to build back shattered balance sheets, the business rates, 100% holiday, although business rates is a devolved matter, it's important for the devolved administrations to have the consequentials flowing from the budget. So what the Chancellor does for English businesses flows through, as we saw um, at the weekend with those grants, there are immediate consequentials flowing through to give the Scottish Government, Welsh Government, Northern Irish Government more headroom in advance of elections to be able to give away some additional grants. So we are exerting maximum pressure for them to use that. And then the final bit about furlough, clearly again, a UK wide issue. How long will it last? How long will it be extended and how will it be tapered? And a key message that we're taking to the Chancellor with all of these is there is no point just kicking the can down the road and moving one cliff edge to another. You now need to work with the industry to get an exit strategy from support measures so that they don't just fall away and the industry topples over because we've survived the black swan last year. It's the grey rhinoceros of debt and continued uncertainty and, and continued problems that will cause many more businesses to fail after we get out of reopening and into recovery. And then a final piece that we're working again across all devolved administrations, although this will be differently nuanced according to regulatory frameworks, is about longer term reform, building back better, building in resilience to tackle some of the structural problems we know we've got, like the structure of business rates, structure of landlord and tenant planning, licensing, to give a platform strongly for, for more rapid growth, more rapid recovery and investment and a return to sort of cultural renewal and renaissance. So that's our key messages that we're taking forward through the budget and beyond. And in England uh, and separately in the devolved administrations, there are tourism recovery strategies. There are urban renewal strategies where we're making sure the grassroots concerns are fed into that. The one final point that uh, seems to be missing in all of this debate in England, and I haven't heard it in, in any of the devolved administration discussions. There's a lot of talk about tourism and leisure, much less talk about return to work. And that is clearly the big challenge that we are going to be facing as a sector, particularly city centre businesses, as it takes much longer to get people back into the habits of work. We flush out and realise what changes have come about uh, centrally uh, as a result of a protracted period of working from home uh, and our cities grapple with how they recover uh, from, from a, a change in business travel as a result of that. I'm going to pause there because that's probably enough to, to be getting on with. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Um, as ever, uh, uh, a comprehensive um, road trip around all the um, latest developments. Um, just in terms of the, the dates and the key dates being obviously the 12th of April, 17th of May and 21st of June, um, 
Paul Milsom asks, what happens if hospitals are virtually empty and cases are well below a thousand per day with no, no one being hospitalized by early April? Um, will we still have to wait to open restaurants indoors for family bubbles and hotels in general? Is it, I mean, is there any chance that that might be relaxed earlier? Personally, I don't think they'll bring forward those dates because they are taking this very cautious approach of it taking three to four weeks to fully feed through um, what the impact is of making those changes. And, and clearly, if you've just opened stuff in 12th of April, you've opened non-essential retail and a whole lot of other indoor activities, um, it will take time and they'll want to see that flow through before they move. What I think is more likely is that you'll be able to open with fewer restrictions and you might be able to bring forward some of the, the earlier stuff uh, and bring it, bring it further through. So if we get to a stage at the beginning of April and their four tests are pace of vaccine rollout and are we delivering according to schedule, which is, uh, you know, all of the over 50s vaccinated in England by um, 15th of April, I think they might be two weeks ahead of that. Um, and are they on track to start to get the rest of the, the adult working age population vaccinated by July? Again, we should know March is a bit of a surge month in terms of giving people second vaccinations as well. Um, the other tests then are, are cases, hospitalizations, deaths, all trends falling. Um, is there any danger of uh, hospitalizations or the NHS being overwhelmed as a result of surging infections? Um, and then the fourth one. So those three, I think, are pretty easy to meet and pretty easy to tick now. The fourth one, which is why they're going to probably stick to that timetable, is new variants. And you can see from yesterday how jittery they were when they suddenly found cases of the Brazil variant. So I think they will go cautiously. Um, and I think that that also means that we are more likely to get the whole of the UK moving in lockstep, which is quite clearly important for hoteliers uh, near the border in Scotland and in Wales, where they are going to lose out to English hoteliers if we're not careful um, and any delay in, in that I think they are quite keen to make sure that there's not too much of a gap between England and the rest of the UK reopening so my suspicion is you won't see those dates change but you might see the conditions under which you can reopen loosen a little bit further thanks Kate and, and in relation to the point you're just making about the, the differential in some of the devolved administrations um, Nicola Sturgeon's announcement of last week left a lot of people gasping for air in Scotland because there was no clarity whatsoever. I mean, do, is there any anticipation that that there is going to be some clarity provided in the in the very near future? That's what we understand. Yes, discussions we've been having. Um, you know, I think there has always been a much more cautious approach in Scotland and in Wales than there has been in, in England uh, and, and a difference of strategy around getting towards closer to zero COVID, uh, which isn't a feasible, feasible aspiration to, to achieve, but it drives the strategy and the approach. So I think that, you know, you were moving slowly towards an indicative date. We were quite surprised in England that we got actual dates in the way that we did from Boris Johnson. We were expecting much more of a Scottish approach. So in that sense, I'm not quite surprised that the sort of the indications all the way along for, from Nicola Sturgeon have been more aspirational, not exact dates. I think you will get clarity. She did helpfully say that, that as soon as it looked as though she was able to and would be led, led by the data, um, those dates would be provided and, and she accepted the need to give people notice. I think, you know, we've got really uh, strong lobbying and representation going in from the Scottish Tourism Alliance on the broader industry and from UK hospitality taking that grassroots voice to the heart of government. We have had that relationship all the way through since we started the reopening plans last year with them. Um, uh, and so, you know, they are very well aware of the need for a date. They are very well aware of industry concerns. They are very well aware of uh, the, the economic impact. Um, and the frustration that people have got. Uh, we just keep plugging away to try and get that, but I, I think we will get that fairly shortly. Okay, I mean, it, it, it was mentioned 15th of March that you know she was going to make another announcement. Do you think there's any realistic chance that it may come before then? Um, well, they have a programme in, in, in Scotland and Wales of, of three, you know, sort of re regular updates, but, but three weekly reviews. So I would have thought the 15th of March is, is a, a sensible, pragmatic timetable. And really what we're talking about is, is a broadly similar approach to what I've just outlined from, from England, uh, but a slippage on some of the dates, which I realise causes real frustration. 
Um, but I think, you know, the, the most effective thing we can do is to channel everybody's collective energies behind STA and UK hospitality to make sure that the Scottish government knows and understands that we are speaking for the industry, that we have the ear of, of industry and of government, and that we don't have any sort of splintering off. The, the easiest thing to, to give the, the Scottish government a get out would be to allow lots of multiple voices to go and talk about lots of different things. That's the, the recipe for getting the worst possible outcome. So I think, you know, unified, coherent voice pushed behind STA and UK hospitality into that tourism recovery group, which is meeting so frequently with ministers, is the best way of getting what we need to do. And clearly then, you know, you do have a need to have lots of things determined before government enters PERDA ahead of elections. So we are looking at a, a sort of very short time period before that will happen. Okay, um, thank you, Kate. Um, Robin Shepherd at Bespoke Hotels asks, Kate, what level of refereeing do you expect from government between landlord and tenant re-unpaid rent? Uh, well, th this is, this is a, again, it's different in the different devolved administrations because everybody's moving it in, in, with different legislative frameworks. In England, uh, the government is looking at extending the rent moratorium um, and we're pushing for them to develop a, an exit strategy from that rather than just put, kicking the can down the road. So it's quite clear that that moratorium will have to change from 31st of March, which was a hard deadline. Uh, we're pushing for it to be six months and then we're asking the government to update the code of practice in order to do some refereeing. Government is desperate to stay out of this, but we've pushed them to, to try and develop a solution which says, you know, maximum, our proposals this, not government's, maximum that you can collect in unpaid rent is 50% uh, and then you have a, a schedule for, for repayment over a period of two to five years. Um, government is desperately hoping that the industry will result in, in, in developing its own solution and then it will put the framework around it to allow that to happen. Uh, so an active discussion but, but I don't think the government is going to step in and mandate as we've seen in Australia and, and uh, Spain for uh, a rent reduction unfortunately. Okay, and in, in terms of the, the grey rhinoceros and, and tapering off the various reliefs, um, I have heard it mooted that, that, that the 5% VAT rate um, or the 15% relief, whichever way you look at it, uh, may, may remain long term. Is that a realistic aspiration or not? Well, I think we would always want it to be and, and I think that you know that would be the long-term campaign that we would be fronting and spearheading whatever comes out of the budget in reality I think the Chancellor given the economic uncertainty at the moment will will probably just postpone it and what we asked for was a sort of postponement in the first instance to allow us to go back and ask for a longer term rate we know the Treasury is quite keen to explore what they can do with VAT post Brexit so so I suspect that the Chancellor will look at a shorter term um, extension and then look at review. But the more times we have it extended, the longer it's in place, the easier it is to convince Treasury and ministers that it should remain in perpetuity. And clearly post-Brexit, you can go in and talk about, you know, a 10% rate, an 8% rate, you can have multiple VAT rates for multiple services, whereas before we were stuck with just the two. Okay. Um... Thank you, Kate. Uh, just a, a couple of last questions on a couple of other points. Um, the Minister for Hospitality Initiative, um, the, the seat at the table um, petition and, and um, action which has been taken thus far. Can you can you give any update as to where where progress has got to on that? Uh, well, we had the parliamentary debate where you had uh, the maximum number of MPs that were allowed to turn up and and, and speak in the debate. So so we had maximum support from cross party. Um, followed up the next day by a tourism debate again maximum numbers so um, hospitality and tourism and the, the need for strong representation for hospitality um, is is continuing to be discussed within government Boris Johnson uh, wrote back to to the, the campaigners uh, they met with the, the current junior minister um, Paul Scully who has who's chaired the hospitality task force throughout the crisis and is de facto um, high street and hospitality minister. Um, so I think it, it, it's sort of moving through and crucially, it's the, the idea of a minister is important. You, it's symbolic. You need somebody within government who looks after that sector, but they always have multiple responsibilities. We have 
three ministers at the moment who look after bits of our sector. Paul Scully, who looks after high streets and retail. Um, uh, Nigel Huddleston, who looks after tourism. Uh, and Victoria Prentice, who looks after the food supply chain. It's helpful to have all three. The key point about a minister for hospitality and a dedicated point is that you need somebody to coordinate activity across government and, and those discussions are ongoing. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, we're, we're sadly nearing um, the, the end of the, um, the, the time allotted. Um, but um, there was one other question here, which I had, uh, which I just wanted to ask. Um, yeah, no, no, just a very simple question. Um, for those on the call who, um, you know, whose businesses are struggling. Uh, is there any direct support, um, and I don't mean financial, but, it, but any advisory support or help that um, they, they could get directly from UKH? I mean, what sort of support are you able to provide as an organization? Uh, yes, we provide support uh, free of charge and, and freely available to all of the industry in terms of advice, guidance, uh, advice on compliance, particularly around COVID and, and reopening, and there's general advice and guidance to, to signpost people to, to other areas of support, government grants, uh, funds that might be available through LEPs and, and uh, those sort of things. And then if you are a member of UKH, but you have to be a member to access it, we have a range of legal helplines, uh, financial helplines, advisory through to professional services, so employment law, um, planning, licensing, uh, landlord and tenant, all of those kind of sort of professional services and advice, um, as well as a, a range of insight and intelligence to be able to inform business planning going further. But the detailed support is only available if you're a member. Um, people are very welcome to contact me and I can put my contact details in the chat if people would like to discuss membership. It starts from £350 a year for a single site. Uh, so I'm very happy to discuss membership with anybody um, and then provide links through. But, but those helplines, those free helplines and advice lines only available if you're a member, sadly. That's very kind. Kate, thank you again for your time. Uh, it's hugely appreciated by us all. It's, I, I think we all slightly feel that we're living in a bit of an information vacuum. So to get it from, um, from you and when, uh, when we know you're so well connected and so well informed um, is comforting, if nothing else. And, and at least there is a, a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel now. So um, hopefully um, we can all move forward together in, into um, sunnier uplands. Um, well, thank you. Kate, thank that, you very be, much. That would be good to look forward to. But as I say, nobody needs to live in an information vacuum. That's the purpose of a trade body and a membership trade organisation. So that's what we're here to do for Before you. Kate go. Um, so happy to help. Hello. Um, hello. Hold on. I've got... Hello. hello. Yeah. Um, I just we have Lord Blunkett. I just wanted to say before Kate goes, what an impressive presentation. Um, if every sector had someone as articulate well-informed and well-connected, uh, they'd be doing very well. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you. I've enjoyed it. In fact, you've made my contribution totally redundant, Kate. <laughs> I don't think that for a minute, but thank you. <laughs> Kate, thank you very much indeed. And uh, I do hope you, you might hang on to your, what Lord Blunkett has to say, and, and I hope you'll come back in perhaps a few weeks and give us a further update. Very happy to, thank you. That's very kind indeed. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, Lord Blunkett, welcome. And um, thank you very much for sparing some of your time today. And I'm sorry we've kept you waiting for a couple of minutes. No, no, I, I was fascinated. I've been listening to Kate for some, some time. Uh, and please, please make it David. Thank you very much, David. Well, before I, I give you free reign, David, I, I just wanted to give um, a brief introduction for the benefit of those on the call, albeit um, I don't really think any introduction is required, but um, for the benef benefit of all, um, David Blunkett was awarded a peerage in the Dissolution Honours List in 2015, taking the title of Lord Blunkett of Brightside and Hillsborough in the city of Sheffield. David was Member of Parliament for Sheffield, Brightside and Hillsborough from 1987 to 2015 and a member of Tony Blair's Cabinet for eight years from 1997. He served as Education and Employment Secretary, Home Secretary and Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. He is currently a Professor of Politics and Practice at the University of Sheffield, Chair of the Board of the University of Law, 
chair of the Heathrow Implementation Steering Group and is involved in a range of voluntary and charitable organizations locally and nationally. But I suspect perhaps most importantly of all, he's an avid supporter of Sheffield Wednesday Football Club. Um, Lord Bunkett, thank you so much for giving us your time and, um, and welcome. If I may, can I um, simply hand you the baton and um, let you tell us what your views of life are at the moment? Well, firstly, obviously you've touched on quite a lot of the issues that are pr predominant for the sector um, with Kate and you've been discussing it internally for all these months. Uh, my, my take is very simple. There was a time when chancellors lost their job for briefing what was going to be in the budget. These days, they would lose their job if they didn't brief uh, what was in the budget. Um, and obviously all of us know pretty well now, with some surprises obviously because chancellors do this, uh, as to what is going to be said by Rishi Sunak tomorrow. And it, it is pretty clear that they're going to continue with some of the things that have been helpful in literally the survival of uh, hotel and hospitality uh, in, in a way that you desperately need to continue, but with some added factors. The, um, the, the desperately needed is obviously the VAT uh, reduction, which you've already been talking to Kate about. And I think that's almost certain to happen. The flexibility that now exists with the use of VAT should be interesting because he may well wish to redeem some of the losses uh, by, um, if you like, um, taking a, an imaginative creative view about VAT in terms of uh, non-food items that are now a feature of delivery as opposed to collection, but that's not part of your industry. Obviously furlough is, is, is already announced anyway that furlough will continue um, for a time uh, and the business rate relief is clearly going to continue. Now th those things are ameliorative rather than actually helping to uh, recover and uh, regain the place that uh, hospitality uh, obviously should be in and that's down to the release of people being able to travel, uh, to enjoy holidays, to be able to pick up the the, the business element uh, of hospitality uh, and of course to be able to uh, encourage people to have the confidence to do so and I'd just like to say three things one is for, for many hotels in urban areas it's not just the domestic audience or the domestic travel that's crucial it's also international travel and uh, with my hat on as having worked with Heathrow although quite a lot of this is now in abeyance for fairly obvious reasons um, getting international travel back up and running uh, will be crucial to hospitality, not least in London. Uh, and that will be an absolutely vital factor. And I think that's down not just to the vaccination programme, which has been really successful, um, but also to international agreements in relation to travel. I, I have a card from Yellow Fever Jab. I also have a card from having had my first vaccine and I see, yeah i see no drake is under you is she pardon hello hello sorry i think i think david's now now left yeah i've been cut off yeah. Hello. You're on mute. Roddy, you're on mute. Roddy, you're on mute. Okay, you're fine. David. Hello, can you hear me? David, yes, we we're can absolutely hear you. fine. Hey. Okay, sorry. I was, I was just talking about international travel and the importance of getting agreement with other countries as well as the vaccine programme um, ourselves, because quite clearly, until we get international travel up and running, the, many parts of the industry will continue to be detrimentally affected, not least in uh, major cities like London, and that would be true uh, of Edinburgh uh, as well. Um, but actually, it's all about confidence. Uh, and I think uh, I happen to be an oddball in terms of my own party, because I think that we should have uh, greater belief that the vaccine is and will be successful 
in uh, not uh, removing, but damping down sufficiently uh, the spread of uh, the virus to make yeah, it possible. I've got that, oh, yeah, yeah. Got that available. That's there. Uh, Apologies, Lord Blunkett. Um, he's been muted as well. You're still very much with us. Okay, thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, th that we should actually try and get up and running before June. Uh, I, I understand the, the government's dilemma. They, they want to use the data rather than the dates. But as Kate was saying, in England, we, we do have the dates. And, and I think it would be possible um, by the, uh, the 12th of April to be able to give a much clearer picture of opening um, fully from May onwards. And that would be a major boost because in the end, it doesn't matter what the chancellor does in uh, the, the terms that I've described and which Kate was talking about. Uh, in the end, it's getting people actually uh, into the hotels, into the restaurants. Uh, it's the footfall. It's people actually feeling confident to go back to what they were doing uh, before this time last year. And once we get that confidence going, then I hope that that will create the economic activity and the economic environment that will allow gradually the, uh, the hospitality industry to get back to what we knew as normal. I think there will be changes. I think people will, uh, many people will have uh, built up a desire to travel. But if it's in a burst followed by uh, a further retrenchment, that would not do hospitality any good. I think we saw last August the, uh, the way in which Eat Out to Help Out was embraced as an economic boost, but actually also uh, quite clearly assisted in spreading the virus. What we don't want uh, is a boost followed by retrenchment. So I think we need uh, other measures to work out how best to respond uh, to outbreaks and to incidents so that we don't end up with a mass closure again. And that does mean planning ahead. And I think the one thing that I would say this morning is that we need consistency. If the government will hold their nerve and the opposition won't push them into even greater caution, then I think we can come out of this with a smooth trajectory upwards rather than uh, an upwards followed by a downwards. And I think that is about understanding that either we believe the virus is a great bait, boon and success, which I do, or we don't. And if we do, then we should have the confidence to go forward and hold our nerve uh, when there will be blips, as there will be in the next three weeks as children return to school. Crucial element in testing that out, followed by a fortnight's uh, Easter break. I think at that point, we ought to be optimistic about being able to open uh, substantially other parts of the economy. I hope that helps. and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much indeed, Lord Bunker. That's extremely helpful. And as per normal, if anybody would like to drop a question into the chat box for Lord Blunkett, um, please do so. And uh, I, I will happily um, post those questions on your behalf. Um, Lord Blunkett, on a, just a couple of points. Um, there are various elections in the offing in, in different parts of the country. Do you, do you see any likelihood that any of those will be will be pushed back as a result of the, the current crisis? No, I don't think the government have been very clear. In fact, they've announced that there will be door-to-door -door canvassing, which is quite bizarre, actually, in terms of uh, locking down uh, in other uh, elements of the economy uh, where measures were and can be taken that obviously uh, safeguard our health and, and well-being, as well as building confidence. Uh, I think, uh, picking up a point Kate was making earlier, uh, whilst the Scottish Government are slightly diverted at the moment, as, you, as you'll be aware in relation to the clash between uh, Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon, um, fish and fowl I call them, um, they, the situation in Scotland will be that they'll want optimism in the run-up to May the 6th and I, I would suspect that uh, Nicola Sturgeon will be a lot more positive uh, in Scotland in the weeks ahead. We have elections everywhere this this uh, May in the UK. Obviously Wales and Scotland uh, have assembly and parliamentary elections, uh, uh, but here in England uh, we have mayor or we have local council and we have police and crime commissioner elections. I think the government are really, really reluctant 
um, to delay any further. Of course, if something drastic happens in the next three weeks, they still have the authority to do so, just as the government I was part of did with foot and mouth disease back in 2001. Thank you very much, David. Um, without wishing to put a, a political spin on it in, in any way, um, can you give us your views in terms of what you think um, Westminster, um, uh, well, the, the government and, and perhaps some of the devolved administrations have done well over the period of the crisis and perhaps what they haven't done quite so well? Well, I think we know what hasn't worked well. I think we know that the initial test and trace uh, centralization was a disaster. We paid very large sums of money for very little in those early months. And had it been decentralized quickly to local level uh, with local directors of public health, I think we could have seen a, a very different picture. And that is what's now being done with the variants, by the way, they're using much more uh, uh, person to person and local approaches, which, which I think will safeguard us. Uh, and of course, we know all about the protective equipment, the PPE, uh, which also went badly wrong. On the, on the PPE, whilst I have very strong views about the way in which contracts were let, I do have some sympathy with the government um, because it was all hands to the pump and very difficult to get equipment in at that, at that stage. Uh, people have talked about the scenario planning that took place back in 2015 and the fact that nobody really took any notice of the lessons that were learned from that desktop exercise. But nevertheless, I have some sympathy with them. The, the, the vaccine rollout has been superb and I think we're all very well aware that that has worked uh, better than most people envisaged. I also think, and it's really interesting, that the distribution systems in our country in terms of uh, retail have really been quite remarkable. It does show how uh, enterprise can adapt and be flexible uh, in a way that uh, centralized planning often can't. And we've had an interesting mixture seeing that you've just touched on politics. I'm, I'm here with my chair hat on as a chair of the uh, Leaders Council rather than a, as a party political politician. And I find in the House of Lords that I can reach agreement with people who I've previously had quite big disagreements with, which can be a very positive thing. Uh, my, my take is that we've had an interesting combination of the best of private enterprise in terms of flexibility, responsiveness, ability to adapt, and the uh, implementation of social democratic policies by a government that would never have dreamt that they were going to implement them in terms of what government have had to do. Um, instead of the government being the problem, governments had to become the solution. And I think that interesting combination might bode us extremely well in the future. Thank you very much, David. Um, interesting question here um, from Scott Morris, who asks, um, how would you compare the government's response on the, the COVID crisis to their response to the foot and mouth crisis? I think people may have learned a little from the foot and mouth crisis. Tony Blair recently said, and I was there, so I saw it, that we were floundering until we decided that we'd have to take really decisive action, despite the very differing views that existed. There were extremely uh, tren trenchant disagreements uh, about whether we could just ride it out with vaccine or whether we would have to do the culling, which was so horrendous in terms of the betrayal and the pictures that people saw and what this meant. Uh, and Tony Blair in the end decided that he would, I, I was the Education Employment Secretary at the time, not the Home Secretary, but he decided he'd had enough of what was then Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Fisheries messing about and brought in the army. And um, I, I happened to have written an, an article uh, in the Daily Mail shortly before Boris wheeled out the army at uh, one of the press conferences. Now that wasn't cause and effect. It was that actually behind the scenes, they'd been bringing in the logistical expertise uh, of the army and they'd been using the, uh, the experience that had been gained previously. So I think that actually 
in an ironic way, 20 years on, we actually saw some of the lessons having been learned about that uh, decisiveness and the logistical uh, challenge. We were also helped this time by volunteers. I mean, they're, they're unsung heroes, people who volunteered in very large numbers to help with the uh, organization uh, of the vaccine delivery and, and uh, the, the vaccine being uh, uh, actually injected into people's arms. And, and that has also been a great feature, which I hope we'll be able to, to use and pick up on uh, in the future. Uh, the, the tragedy of the, the foot and mouth disease was not so much, although I might be shot down for this, the farmers who got compensated, it was all the ancillary industries, local community industries of, of the, the local hotels, the, the restaurants, the cafes, uh, the uh, leisure activities that were really badly damaged because of course they weren't wholly compensated uh, and they were the ones who suffered from what was effectively the close down of those areas. So there is, there is a, a mirror effect here, uh, which, which we're seeing 20 years on. Thank you very much, a very interesting comparison. Um, it, it, it strikes me, David, that over the, the period of the, the COVID crisis, that, that actually the, the opposition um, parties and, and the government have, have worked much better in tandem. There seems to have been much less party political sort of babble um, in, in the, the air. I mean, is that, is that a fair, sort of assessment of what's going on and, and do you think that will last or do you think this will be short-lived until COVID has become a thing of the past? Well, well here's a, here's a twist. <laughs> I think that Keir Starmer's caution uh, in relation to moving too quickly and unlocking too quickly has actually resulted in Boris being more cautious. <laughs> Uh, and now I think is a, a moment, and I have spoken to Keir Starmer recently about this, when we need to be a bit more optimistic as an opposition in order to allow the government a bit, of, a bit more space to be able to, um, to accelerate the unlocking process. I mean, that's one of the real twists of fate, because you'd never have expected that. It would have normally been the other way around. I think on recovery, um, we, we have an interesting juxtaposition uh, of an opposition suggesting that this moment in time uh, increased taxes might not be a good idea uh, and uh, an, an ex-foreign secretary in the form of William Hague this morning in the Telegraph saying it's unrealistic and taxes must rise. I think it, we need to be very careful which taxes because the one thing that will get us out of this is growth. Um, the bank, the governor of the Bank of England is very clear but as far as the borrowing is concerned, uh, we can deal with that over the next half century if growth exceeds the cost of servicing the debt. But what we can't do is continue borrowing in order to spend on day-to-day -day services. So we need to restore the income coming into the government for day-to-day -day revenue expenditure very quickly indeed. And I, I think the, the general feeling is that you've got to be extremely careful not to damp down that growth and that recovery by taxing the wrong people at the wrong time. My, my feeling is that we should have a windfall levy on those who have done extremely well during the pandemic. We should find a way of accelerating, including international agreement, how we can um, better tax the big tech companies who, who get, get away with blue murder in terms of what they pay back into the exchequer whilst those with fixed cost and fixed um, uh, physical property obviously can't get away in the future from uh, business rate in some contribution. I think the business rate will be drastically reassessed, whichever government uh, is in power, but we'll always have a property tax because it's the one tax that can't be evaded. And to do that, to continue with that, you need a tax on those who don't rely on fixed property and assets, um, but actually are able to be footloose, as we've seen with high streets, um, where those who have gone bust have, have been taken over by those who don't need other than the warehousing. 
uh, the facilities that previously existed, which is why I suggested at the beginning of this discussion that there might have to be a real radical thinking about the way in which we use VAT. Thank you, David. Um, on a lighter note, um, where are you going for your holiday this year? Well, I'm going to go to Italy and I've already booked my flights at the end of July. My wife says I shouldn't keep saying this because there'll be somebody noting it down for burgling the house when we're not here. Um, and I, I shall be very careful to get the neighbours to keep an eye out. Um, I just think we've got to be optimistic. I just think we've got to feel that we can do that. I, I've got some plans for uh, travel domestically as well. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the spring and summer, which I think saved us last year and will save us again. This time, I hope that people will to, to travel in July, August, September, October without the, uh, the, the blowback that we had last year. And I think that's why the vaccine has been so important. But also, people have, on the whole, people have understood the measures that they have to take including hospitality having taken phenomenal steps uh, to put in place safeguarding. I, 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 when I went out to restaurants before the November lockdown, I felt safer in the, that environment than I did uh, in just moving about because people had taken really careful steps. And I think that should be acknowledged and recognized in unlocking and in the recovery program. Um, thank you. And I, I tend to ask our guests to peer into their crystal ball at some point in, in the dialogue. Um, and you know, we've all got a crystal ball, but uh, I think I think most of them are, are pretty foggy. But if, if you sort of cast forward 12, 18, 24 months, um, how do you how do you think life may be at that? at that stage? Will it be a return to what we used to know as normal, or do you think there will be underlying differences in, in the way that life is conducted? I think in terms of what we might call the superficial economy, and at least the job market, within two years, we'll have recovered, we'll have bounced back in the jargon uh, much more rapidly than, than people think. I think there are underlying challenges uh, which I've, I've got to find a way of uh, describing uh, carefully, which is if you think that uh, currently, depending on who you listen to, there are about four and a half million people on furlough. Uh, there are many people who are working from home but will be expected not to uh, and will possibly have part of their week uh, in the, the office or the facility. I think we've got a real problem in re-motivating, in uh, re-engaging, in people getting back the structure of their lives. And I think that's going to be a big challenge in terms of both productivity uh, and get up and go, and, and as well as mental health. And I think we'll probably need a program which actually starts to try and address that. Uh, it, I would describe it as re-energizing uh, both socially and economically, our country. Because if you talk to people, or including those who are working very hard online and for very long hours, the structure has changed in their lives and reasserting uh, a more, in quotes, normal pattern of life, I think is gonna take some considerable time and we'll find people struggling uh, to be able to achieve that. It's one reason why, uh, because I'm allowed to do so, I'm continuing to go down to London as I will later today and to work inside the Palace of Westminster, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, L literally. I don't have to, I could do it online. Uh, I wouldn't receive the allowance, but I could do it online um, and uh, it would make life easier. But it would also make it virtually impossible to get back into some sort of normality quickly uh, once the lockdown's over. And I suspect a lot of people feel the same way. 
David, thank you very much indeed. Um, we, we've sort of arrived very sadly at the witching hour, um, but I, I want to thank you on behalf of all of the 120 or so people who've been on the call for, for your time today. It's been massively appreciated. I mean, you're talking very much to a, a grassroots of the of the hospitality, leisure and wider tourism sector. And, and um, we're all hugely grateful. In fact, there's a very nice comment that's just been dropped into the chat box, which I will read to you, which says, well done, Lord, Brill Lord Blunkett. What a brilliant and sensible politician. Wish we heard more from people like him rather than the endless sage scientists who are loving the publicity. So I think that's a, a, a very so solid ringing endorsement um, of you. And, and thank you so much. Um, it's thank hugely you, appreciated. Sir. Thank you for the comment and thank you for having me. And I keep reminding the people who appear all the time with doom and gloom that most of them, in fact, virtually all of them, are still getting their salary. Go well. <laughs> Take care. Indeed. Thank you very, very much indeed, David. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Um, for the um, benefit of everybody else, I hope you enjoyed that session with um, Kate, who was, um, of course, as informative uh, as ever and and David Blunkett, who I thought was uh, very perceptive and very interesting. Um, next week, we have um, Fergus Ewing, um, Scottish Minister for Tourism and the Rural Economy, and um, some new guests, um, David Hossack um, and um, Julian Troop from Colliers International, who are going to talk particularly about the hotel property market, um, values, transactions, and what the future might hold. So uh, that also promises to be a very interesting session. So um, until next week, again, take care, look after yourselves. I hope you've enjoyed today. Um, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to join us um, and look after yourselves. All the very best, take care. Thanks, Roddy. Bye, Roddy. Bye, Noel. Great pleasure. Great pleasure. Thanks, Roddy. Thank you, Roddy. Cheers, Roddy. Thank you. Thanks, Roddy. Great pleasure. Thanks, Roddy. Thank you, Roddy. Thank you. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, Roddy. Thanks, Roddy. Great pleasure. Great pleasure. Cheers. Cheers. Bye bye. Thanks. I have a feeling my silver fox might be feeling a bit snubbed, Robbie. <laughs> um, well, no, I, no I, the problem is I really need somebody with a UK-wide perspective, and the silver fox is spotified.